then we have a computation of uh, Hichelieu isogenous chains with Sabrina. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about the computation of Richelieu isogeny chains. Um, those are a special type of isogenies and um, on the Jacobians of genus two curves. So yesterday we've already heard a lot about those and also about computing more general isogenies um, on abelian varieties. And my talk will focus on only this case of Richelieu isogenies. And I start by giving some um, more details on the general setting of genus two curves and their Jacobians. Um, so first of all, what is a genus two curve? Um, a genus two curve similar as an elliptic curve can be affinely defined by an equation of the form y squared equals f of x. Um, here, the polynomial f has degree five or six. Mm, and we call this equation y squared equals f of x, um, a hyperelliptic equation. And here below, you can see two um, sketches of hyperelliptic curves, one where we have a degree five polynomial, and on the right side, one with a degree six polynomial. So this is just that you have some picture in mind. And yeah, maybe you can see, yeah, because this polynomial has higher degree than an elliptic curve, we have, yeah, for example, if you just leave out the left part of the left picture, you get a picture of an elliptic curve again. So, so yeah. So, um, yeah, for hyperelliptic equations are, of course, not unique, but um, there are many different equations that define um, a curve that is isomorphic um, over K. And you can move between different curve equations by using so-called coordinate transformations, and those are of the form that is given here. And in this talk, we'll um, be talking about two specific type of equations. I just called them type one and type two equations. Uh, the first one is an equation of the four y squared equals e times x times x squared minus ax plus one times another quadratic factor. And this type one equation is somehow inspired by the Montgomery form for elliptic curves. So if you leave out um, the last um, quadratic factor, what you get is um, an elliptic curve in Montgomery form. And then the type two equation is now an equation of degree six. Here, um, it's maybe not so obvious where this um, definition comes from, but um, it's motivated by the isogenous disease that we will compute later. So you will see later why this type two equation appears. Uh, yeah, it's um, important to note that, of course, over K, not every um, hyperelliptic curve has an equation of this form. But um, one might it might be necessary to, to go to a, a field extension to obtain uh, such an equation. But um, there exists an easy, um, sufficient criterion for the existence of such, such an equation. And that's if all the Weierstrass points are k-rational. So this means if the polynomial f, so if we're given a hyperelliptic curve, y squared equals f of x, and the polynomial f has all its roots in k, then um, we can always find an equation of type one and type two. Yeah, and also one can show that's actually very easy to see from the equations that um, the existence of a type one equation is equivalent to the existence of a type two equation, but just applying an easy coordinate transformation between the two. Okay, so um, yeah, I'll briefly say something about points on hyperelliptic curves as well. So here again, the situation is comparable to elliptic curves. Um, we need to distinguish the cases where the degree of the polynomial f is five and where it is six. So in general, we have affine points that are uh, just points of the form uy, so points on the plane, which uh, satisfy the hyperelliptic equation. So we have that v squared is equal to f of u. And now um, if the degree of the polynomial f is five, there is exactly one point at infinity, as in the elliptic curve case. If the degree is six of the polynomial, we have two points at infinity, and I will denote them by infinity plus and infinity minus. Okay, an important set of points are so-called Weierstrass points. I, yeah, I think I already mentioned them on the last slide. Um, those are the points that are fixed by the hyperelliptic involution. So the hyperelliptic involution is just um, the map that sends a point x, y to um, x minus y. Yeah, and 
yeah, it's important to note that um, in the degree five case, um, the point at infinity is a Weierstrass point. So this is a point that is fixed by the involution. In the degree six case, um, the two points at infinity are permuted. So what you can see is that every um, genus two curve, no matter if it's defined by degree five equation or degree six equation has exactly six Weierstrass points. So on the first picture with the degree five equation, you can only see five because you don't see the point at infinity, but yeah, it's there. Uh, yeah, and now um, the important property about genus two curve. So in some sense, they are a generalization of elliptic curves, but um, unfortunately the points on um, a hyperelliptic curve do not form a group. And that's uh, why we're going to look at Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves. Those are abelian varieties. Um, and so, which means that they are a variety and um, they have a, natural, a group structure on them. So here I can't give um, all the definitions about uh, Jacobian varieties. And we've already seen a lot about this in um, the last talk by, uh, or in the talk yesterday by Damien Robert. Um, but I will um, at least explain how elements of the Jacobian look like because this will be important later. So in general, an element of the Jacobian can be seen as, um, or can be represented as an equivalence class of devices. And here, since we are in the genus two setting, um, one can also find a very um, compact form of such a representative and which is also uniquely defined. So any element um, J uh, can be represented as the sum of two points, P1 plus P2, minus uh, the divisor at supported at infinity. So this divisor D infinity in the degree four, five case is just two times infinity. And in the degree six case, we take infinity plus plus infinity minus. Yeah, so maybe I should also say, because it's not really something that you see in elliptic curve. So a divisor is just a formal sum of points on a curve. Okay. And um, the presentation for points or for elements of the Jacobian that we will use actually is the so-called Mumford presentation. Um, so um, say we are given um, an element of the Jacobian, which is um, yeah of the form P1 plus P2 minus D infinity. And then if we now assume for simplicity that P1 and P2 are both affine points, so they have coordinates U1, V1 and U2, V2, then we can define a polynomial A, um, which is X minus U1 times X minus U2. So that's a quadratic polynomial. And we can define another polynomial B, which interpolates the two points. So that B of U1 is V1 and B of U2 is V2. And um, so, the polynomials A and B are called the Mumford presentation of the divisor. And here on this figure um, on the right hand side, I just depicted a divisor for or uh, an element of the Jacobian and Mumford presentation for illustration. So we have this um, Jacob um, element J of x squared plus x minus two. So that's the polynomial A, which has roots um, minus two and one. So those are the x coordinates of the two points in the support. And then the polynomial B is just zero. So the y coordinates are zero. So now after these details, um, we're now going to move on to talk about isogenies of Jacobians of genus two curves. And yeah, before really talking about isogenies, we'll have to briefly also talk about uh, torsion elements of the Jacobian, because as for elliptic curves, an isogeny is defined by its kernel, which is a finite subgroup of um, the Jacobian in this case. Um, so maybe if you, we can compare this to the situation of elliptic curves there, the M torsion is um, a rank two module. So it's isomorphic to Z mod M Z squared. Now here, since we are in genus two, we get some uh, Z mod M Z um, to the power four. So you can generalize this also to higher genus where then you would get in the exponent two times the genus. And we also have a wild pairing, which is defined on this torsion. Um, yeah, this will become um, very important later for defining uh, isogenies. So, yeah, for illustration, I also, um, yeah, checked, uh, 
or wrote down what this means for a concrete example. Um, especially the two torsion will become important in this talk. So let's look at the two torsion. Um, here, there is a nice curve. So for elliptic curves, the two torsion points are just the via stress points. So the points with um, y coordinate zero. And here in this setting, the two torsion points of the Jacobian are pairs or are determined by pairs of via stress points. So this means um, we have six via stress points. If we look at all possible pairs of those, we get six choose two. So those are 15 elements plus the zero elements. So we really get 16 uh, po points in our two torsion group, which is two to the four. And we can also describe the wild pairing on um, those two torsion elements in an easy way. So say we have two two torsion elements, which correspond to two pairs of wire stress points, then um, the wild pairing is trivial if those are just if the pairs are the same, of course, and if the pairs are disjoint. But if they have one um, point in common, then the wild pairing is minus one. Yeah, okay. So now I'll continue to talk a bit about general isogenies um, before we specialize to the case where L is equal to two. So yeah, that's also something that Damien Robert already mentioned yesterday. An L -L isogeny is an isogeny between um, two, in general, abelian surfaces, not only uh, Jacobians, um, where the group or the kernel group uh, is, the, is of the form Z mod L Z squared. So this is comparable to in the elliptic curve case where we have a kernel, um, which is a cyclic group of order L. And now here we just have, we don't have a cyclic group, but a group of rank two. And now um, an additional important property is that the wild pairing restricted to this group has to be trivial. This is a condition that doesn't appear for elliptic curves. Um, Actually, it does appear, but you don't see it because it's automatic. You just have a cyclic group. So this means if you restrict the wild pairing to elements of this group, it's always trivial. Yeah. You can define the multiplication by L isogeny, and then it is not trivial for elliptic curves. Uh, sorry, can you? If say you it? define the multiplication by L isogeny, that's also an isogeny. Mm -hmm. It is not trivial. Ah, so I mean meant for an L isogeny, mm -hmm. not in general for an isogeny, yeah. but for an L isogeny. Yeah. Okay, and um, so if we want to combine those LL isogenies. So um, if we take a composition of LL isogenies, then um, in the elliptic curve case, we would get something that is an L to the N isogeny. And here um, the situation gets a little bit more difficult because um, we don't only get a group that, so there are different possibilities for the group structure of the resulting group. And yeah, for example, we could have a group of rank three where the first um, component is a cyclic group of orders um, of order L to the N, and then there are two more components. Mm. And again, the wild pairing restricts trivially onto this group. And the group of this form with these properties is then called a maximal L to the N isotropic group. And in this talk, we will um, yeah, um, only consider a special case of this case above, and that's the case where K is equal to zero. This might at a first glance seem like a restriction because it, is, it exclu excludes all other possibilities for K. But actually, if you look at, for example, cryptographic examples, that's not really a restriction to only consider groups of this type. Okay, so now um, I finally get to talk about Richelieu isogenies. So this is the case of L is equal to two. So these are, all, one can also say that they are two, two isogenies. And for such isogenies, there exists very explicit and nice formulas um, to represent them. Mm. So these res the results on this slide are all due to Richelieu, which is, I don't know, I think results from the last century. 
Um, so if we have a hyperelliptic curve um, equation of the form y squared equals f of x, then one can choose a quadratic splitting of this polynomial f. So we split it into three quadratic factors. Maybe the last one could also be just a degree one um, factor. Mm, and yeah, now, first of all, this already defines a maximal two isotropic group. If we just take um, yeah, the four, four elements where which the first one is the zero element, then um, the element which corresponds to the first two Weierstrass points, then the next two and the next two. And for this particular um, isogeny with this kernel, one can already write down the codomain of the isogeny in a very easy way. So it's y squared times h1, uh, y squared equals h1 times h2 times h3 where the polynomials hi are defined in terms of um, the gi's. So here in this formula, the indices should be viewed modulo three. And gi prime, by gi prime, I mean the derivative of gi. And so this already allows us to compute um, codomains of isogenies very easily. And now to compute, um, to push points through those isogenies, um, one needs to do a little more work, but there exists um, a nice correspondence between the curves. So what you see here is the so-called Richelieu correspondence, and um, which holds for points uv, so a point p on the curve c with coordinates uv, and a point p prime on the other curve uh, c prime with coordinates u prime v prime. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll already go to the next slide. There is a um, small illustration of this uh, thing. So say we have a point P with coordinates u, v, then you can plug in the coordinate u um, into the first equation. And yeah, maybe if you remember from the last slide was the, what the h, i are, those are quadratic polynomials. This means, um, so plugging in u gives you a quadratic polynomial in u prime. So you get precisely two um, solutions for u prime. Then you can use the second equation, plug in u, u prime, and v, and you get one solution for v prime. This means in total we get two points, p1 and p2, that correspond to this one point p on um, the curve c. Um, yeah, okay. So this is now a correspondence between curves, but what we actually want is um, an isogeny that goes or a map um, from the Jacobian of the first curve to the Jacobian of the other curve. And so one can extend this map. So first, maybe what one could do is to define a map um, that goes from the curve C to the divisor group of C prime by just saying that a, a point P is mapped to the formal sum of the points P1 plus P2 on the other curve. Then one can extend this to um, a map on the Jacobian by saying, um, as is written down here, so we have the points P and Q in the support, um, so or the affine points in the support P and Q, and we can just apply this Richelieu correspondence to get P1 plus P2, Q1 plus Q2. And then one can also check that it's okay to take um, two times the divisor at infinity as the image of the infinity. And this is um, how one can use this Richelieu correspondence to construct a map um, or to construct this map explicitly and push points through the isogeny. Yeah. Um, so now um, I'll finally get to the algorithm that I want to present for computing a change of Richelieu isogenies. And the motivation for this algorithm to make something similar as is done for uh, um, the SIDH keying change, but in genus two. Okay, so here is, um, yeah, maybe the setup of the algorithm. Uh, we start with an hyperelliptic curve that has now a type two equation. You see um, later why we start with this type two equation. Mm, and we choose a special symplectic basis for the two to the n torsion. Yeah, I haven't talked about uh, symplectic basis here, but what you can think of is, um, for example, if you have a vector space with some uh, 
this is an inner product, then you can compute an orthogonal basis. And now here we don't have a vector space, but a module and a pairing on this. And so a symplectic basis is in some sense the analog to this case. So it's, yeah, one can view it as an orthogonal basis of a vector space where the properties are a little different, but yeah. And yeah, maybe it's important to note. So for elliptic curves, um, you would do something similar. So in the beginning of an SIDH protocol, for example, you also choose a basis for the two to the n torsion. And this basis is also a symplectic basis with respect to the wild pairing. But again, for elliptic curves, um, this property comes for free. So you don't really uh, check this, but it is the case. Um, yeah, okay. And then how do we choose our... Um, so now we want to compute a two to the n isogeny, uh, two to the n, two to the n isogeny. Um, and we choose the generators of um, the kernel um, to be of this particular form. So um, to see that this is really a maximal isotropic subgroup, that's something that uh, I worked on together on a previous paper with Jan Boti and Charlotte Weitkamp, who's also here. Um, yeah, so I refer to this paper if you want to see the details, but for now I just say that this is really a maximal two to the n isotropic group. And maybe it might seem a bit restrictive to um, just choose groups of this form, but again, um, one can make this more general and still apply the same algorithm. Okay, and so what is the output of the algorithm? Of course, we want to know the co-domain of the isogeny. And in general, we will also, it will also be possible to push points through this isogeny. But... Yeah, and um, yeah, a restriction that I already wrote down here. So something that was very important um, in the talks yesterday is that we don't always get um, the Jacobian of a hyperelliptic curve again if we apply an isogeny, but there are some uh, cases where we actually end up in a product of two elliptic curves. So this is something that I didn't uh, treat in my work because yeah, I, at that moment, I didn't see that it would become that important later, but yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so now what's the general um, outline of the algorithm? Um, so the first, uh, yeah, maybe the main idea is similar to elliptic curves. If we want to compute a chain or, or a two to the n isogeny, we um, yeah compute all the two isogenies separately. So we compute it as a chain of two isogenies. So this is just meant to fix some notation here. So we will do the same thing. The important part is now how do we um, do the computations in each step of this isogeny chain. And um, the step is, again, so each isogeny step, so each 2 2 isogeny is divided into two steps. So first, um, recall that in the beginning, we start with a type 2 equation. And we have some kernel, um, which is of yeah, due to the choice of our basis of some special form, but we, yeah, there are still many options for how the kernel looks like. And what we want to do is we first apply a transformation to end up in a type one equation. So this was the equation that was similar to the Montgomery form of elliptic curves. And um, with this um, transformation, we also want to um, transform the kernel of the isogeny into a very specific form. And if we do this, we can then apply a nice 2 2 isogeny formula that I will present on the next slide. Yeah, so before I describe the transformation that we need, um, I'll say something about the 2 2 isogeny formula. So remember that from the correspondence that I showed before, there were several steps necessary to push a point through the isogeny. And but we can also write this down in a specific formula. And to make this as easy as possible, I chose a very particular setup. So I chose a curve which has this Montgomery-like form. And um, as the kernel generators, I chose um, the uh, as the first one to be um, supported at a point at zero and infinity. And the second one is supported at um, the roots of x squared minus ax plus one. Okay, so then already, so, 
this first part of the theorem is now something that you've seen before um, comes from the first part of the original low isogeny. So it's just about computing the codomain. Here, that's now where the type two equations come into play. The codomain will be defined by a type two equation. And the coefficients of this type two equations are just given with this easy formulas. Okay, and now the more important part is how do we put um, that there are also explicit formulas to push points through the isogenies. So if we have a point on or an element of the Jacobian of um, our starting curve, which has this these Montgomery coefficients a with a i and b i, we can write down explicit formulas for the Montgomery coefficients um, of the image point. The statement here is a little simplified. Really what I do is that I uh, write down formulas um, where the, Mon the Mumford presentation is not reduced yet. Oh, sorry, I think I said Montgomery before, I mean Mumford. Um, but um, one can also directly write down um, the compact Mumford presentation. It's just not as nice. So in my paper, the, formulas, the formula looks a bit longer. Okay, so that was it about um, the isogeny formula. Now, um, the step that is missing is um, to transform any equation or any kernel that we have um, into this particular setup that for which we have the formula. And so this transformation that we are looking for, um, ah, yeah, so here I just gave the details. So what is the setup we have? Um, a hyperelliptic equation and some to two group and our goal is to find a transformation so that um, the image um, curve um, has a, is a type one equation and the kernel generators are of this particular form that I've shown before and we do this in, in several steps the first one is to factorize or to compute the roots of the polynomials g1 and g2 at the first glance, this might seem to require yeah, computing roots, uh, spare roots, but um, here it's important that we chose this special setup. So um, that we chose the symplectic basis and the kernel, which was generated in this particular form. And because of that, we can deduce the roots um, very easily by a case distinction and don't really have to factor the polynomials or to compute any square roots to do that. And now as a second step, um, we can already um, compute the first coordinate transformation that gives us a form that is very similar to the one that we want. So the idea is, so if x is sent to x minus alpha two over x minus alpha one, this means that the root alpha one will be sent to infinity and root alpha two will be sent to zero. So the, for the resulting equation that we get, I, I wrote this down here, is already similar to the type one equation. So we have the Weierstrass point zero and infinity. The only problem is that now um, for we want to have the second quadratic factor, so x minus beta one times x minus beta two. This should now be of the form x squared minus ax plus one. So this requires one more coordinate transformation. And here we can just scale by some coefficient a. And this a is computed as um, the square root of one over beta one times beta two. If you plug this in into the um, equation that we had before, you can see that um, this means that, um, yeah, we get the new beta ones and beta two are just the inverse of each other. And yeah, here, um, this again seems like a, little costly step because it requires to compute a square root and it's also not completely quick clear why the square root would be um, in k yeah and that's where uh, something um, I think a nice result comes into play and that's um, that we can actually compute the square root from a four torsion point so remember, so like in SIDH, um, if we want to compute the chain of two, two iso of two isogenies, we also we don't only have the two torsion group, but we also have a four torsion group, uh, four torsion elements, and so this is something that we have here as well. And um, 
Yeah, and this, yeah, I, I'm not going to read out this whole formula, but what you see here is that uh, there are just um, the Mumford uh, coordinates, A, I, and B, I, um, that appear, and um, the roots beta one and beta two on the right hand side. And from these, you can deduce um, the square root of beta one times beta two. And so maybe uh, where does this come from? Um, so the main, the main idea for the proof was to use a result by Yuri Sahin, who showed uh, or who provided explicit formulas for dividing elements by two on Jacobians of, of hyperelliptic genus two curves. And in particular, what he showed, oh yeah. Ah, sorry, that's the leading coefficient. Did I? Oh yeah, so the CG and the CF are the same. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so um, yeah, but what does Sahin's results say? Um, he shows how to represent um, division by two of um, this point on the Jacobian, which is given by um, with Mumford presentation x and zero, um, just by using symmetric functions in um, the negative of the remaining roots of the polynomial. And one can use these expressions and just do some basic algebra to get um, the expression that I found here. Okay, I have to hurry a bit. So now um, I explained um, how this algorithm works and the question is why was I interested in um, doing this? Um, the first, or yeah, my main motivation was to look at the generalization of the SIDH protocol to genus two that was already suggested by Victor Flynn and uh, Jan Boti at PQQ Crypto. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that similar attacks as applied to SIDH will also apply to this. But of course, um, the algorithm can also be used to compute um, isogeny chains in other settings. For example, one could um, potentially um, accelerate or speed up um, the genus 2 hash function that was um, first introduced by Takashima and then uh, um, an improved version by Walter Kastrick, Thomas de Cruz, and Ben Smith. And also one can imagine to do uh, yeah, other isogeny-based protocols that only require the computation of two isogenies and the elliptic curve setting, like for example, to look at this verifiable delay function uh, for elliptic curves and make a genus two version of this. And yet the only part which I noted here also um, that is still missing is um, if you want to compute a very long chain of um, two two isogenies, you for to use this algorithm, you would, will have to recompute um, a symplectic basis after a certain number of steps. And at the moment, this is um, at least with the methods from Magma that I use, this is super slow. So it will not really give a speed up. But um, maybe if in the future uh, somebody develops a faster algorithm or implements some ex faster existing algorithm, then this could potentially speed up. Uh, those um, computations. For example, this was already achieved in the elliptic curve case. I think the hash function can be um, is or is faster if you don't if you use um, SIDH type methods. This was a paper presented at uh, this year at Selected Areas of Cryptography Conference, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And now the last application that was a bit unexpected to me is you can use the algorithm to make the attack on SIDH faster than it is already. Okay, and now finally, uh, just some notes on the performance. Um, so my main uh, reference when I prepared this paper was the implementation by Victor Flynn and Jan Boti. It was meant only as a proof of concept implementation. So it's so um, this was not very fast. Uh, for example, so I, for this comparison, I used um, the parameter set that was given in their work um, where we have a prime of around 100 bits. And there, a pure isogeny computation uh, needed around 72 seconds. And if you also wanted to push image points through, so for image points to, so in the first round of the key exchange, then it was 127 seconds. Then I also compared it to the genus two hash functions, 
where of course I have the restriction that I can only hash uh, small messages um, and which is a lot faster, but you can't use the methods to push image points through. And now I also included um, some newer algorithms that were developed at the same time. So the one that um, is used for attacking SIDH and then also the Sage math implementation of this. And yeah. So I think, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. And thanks for your attention. <laughs> So do we have any questions? Don't be shy. You can make questions. Thank you. At some point in some slide, you said that the formulas didn't work for the split case or mm -hmm. when, and then you said you applied to the attack. So where's the catch? Yeah, okay. Um, so in the attack, um, I think we already, we only want to know if um, it splits or not. And maybe, uh, Mm -hmm. so, ah, yeah. so in the theorem, I say that these formulas hold if C is not equal to one. So C is this, it's not a curve, it's the coefficient up there. And now if C is equal to one, then we end up in the case that splits. So we can detect very easily if um, something splits or not, but my formulas don't work for pushing points through um, those. Any other question? Okay, I have one. Uh, it's because you said that it doesn't work yet for hyper elliptic curves. The, um, I remember, I think it was like some slides ago that mm -hmm. you couldn't generalize. Um... Right? No. I think it's. Uh, okay, anyway. No? No, I think it was a little bit in front, but. Uh, so should we expect soon something like um, more generalization from the algorithm or just uh, like, uh, no, you're... Uh, maybe you're also referring to um, that case that you, um, what I don't, what I have not included is to um, include formulas for the splitting. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, it's, so there already exist um, results on this. I just didn't include it in this setup. So I think it shouldn't be too hard to um, also include this here, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any more question? Not, okay, we can also just question Sabrina during the cough break. So let's just think of Sabrina. <laughs> 